Anyway, let's go beyond that. Uh, there are times in life when we are more gracious to others than, than other times. Uh, I remember when Don and I were in Penny shopping, and um, a lady came up to me and asked me for a da donation for a March of Dimes. And, of course, she told me a little bit about it and explained it. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And before you think I'm very magnanimous in giving, uh, you have to realize that Donna was pregnant at the time. So when I'm hearing these things of, that they help in birth defects and, and for pregnant mothers, I, I kind of gave, I don't think it was a karma type of thing where I thought, well, if I give, uh, you know, everything will be fine. But I got to say, a little bit in the back of my mind thought if I didn't give and we had complications, I would feel so terribly guilty. Um, not that I believe in the karma, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things you do. And, 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 of course, they're doing a March of Dimes walk today, I think it is, down in Cincinnati. Uh, it's a good organization. Uh, it did make me feel good to give to a cause. It wasn't just uh, out of those situations of her being pregnant. Uh, we've given to many organizations over the years. Um, Compassion International, you may know that we've been involved with them for quite a while. When we attended the uh, uh, vineyard down in uh, Anderson Township, they were big on doing servant evangelism. I don't know if you've heard of that. That's kind of their, their goal there. The church would purchase food from the grocery and we'd bag it up on a Saturday and we'd have, I don't know, maybe 48 bags of groceries. It's paper bags, not the plastic bags. So we, we would stuff it full and... Uh, we would go out to a housing project or apartment complex or a trailer, trailer park or, and just pass them out to households. Just go up on a Saturday morning, knock on the door. If somebody came, fine. If they didn't come, uh, that was okay, too. And, and just say, the only question we had was, could you use a, 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 some groceries? And if they said yes, then we, we would give those groceries away. And if, if not, you'd be surprised how many people would say, no, we, we don't need anything. We're good. But, you know, this couple over here, they're, they're having a real hard time. He just got laid off or whatever. And so if we went over there and knocked and nobody answered the door, we'd come back and say, could you give that bag of groceries to them? Um, so there was people that might have taken advantage, but there were people that were very big hearted and, and understanding what we were trying to do to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, of course, I always took advantage of it because if if. They didn't want us there, and they just wanted, to, you could tell they just wanted you to go away. So they, they would usually say, no, we're good, we're good, just, just uh, we're fine. And I said, well, good, well, I'm glad to hear it. Could we pray with you and give God thanks for that? <laughs> so I would try to get a prayer in no matter what. That's uh, important that uh, people see our witness and how, us being servants in the kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We've had a great example of how to serve through your son, Jesus Christ. So as we look at that today, we, we ask that you would continue to soften and work with our hearts in the areas where we're a little stubborn, a little uh, stiff, and allow us to, uh, to be more like Jesus each and every day. Pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Uh, you may have noticed in the bulletin that our discussion has moved to the Gospel of John. I may use some other material here and there. I know I'm going to refer to Luke, but uh, I just wanted to focus on the conversations that happened in the upper room uh, hours before Jesus was arrested and beaten, crucified, and died and was buried and resurrected. As I was wondering what I was going to start teaching on, because uh, I don't have this stuff laid out, I prayed about it and... Uh, it was just impressed on me that if I was one of the apostles, one of the disciples, and all this stuff has happened, then, man, I'd be starting to think, what did Jesus have to say? What was his last words to us? And start putting those back together. I have to start with the most recent and, and work my way back trying to recall. So today we're, we'll start looking at the upper room conversations that Jesus had with his disciples on that night before he was arrested. We'll start with John chapter 13, verse 1. So it was just before Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he 
now show them the full extent of his love. So we're going to see a little bit more as, as the evening progresses. This is written by the Apostle John who was there. He was an eyewitness to everything that happened. And John loved Jesus tremendously. And John knew that the heart of Jesus was to love these men in this room, the other apostles. The evening, whoop, now we're going that though. There we go. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up after the meal, got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. There's speculation that the owner of the home who would normally have had a servant wash the feet of the apostles and Jesus, that maybe the, the owner had left these men to their own conversations and had just left them alone and let them have their private time. And maybe being eager to get Jesus in off the streets and, and trying to keep him out of harm's way, the custom of washing the, the guests' feet uh, was just probably overlooked and they'd gone on and went to the meal because it was ready. It had already been prepared. I find it interesting that as John looks back on these conversations that they had, he realizes now that, that Satan was already at work in the mind of Judas in order to turn Jesus over to the authorities. And also that Jesus is fully God and sent by God. And he was going back to God, the Father. John is saying that Jesus knew all that was going on around him, including the plans that Judas had made. And yet, and yet Jesus did nothing to stop it. He had all the power he needed, but Jesus was letting this betrayal play out. So instead of confronting Judas, Jesus gets up from the meal that they had started and takes off his outer cloak, gets a towel, and pours water in a pan and starts washing the disciples' feet. They didn't worry about it when they came in. They maybe not even talked about it. So you've got to figure out well, why, why all of a sudden is he getting up and, and starting to wash their feet? Why would Jesus just do this out of, on the spur of the moment? The Gospel of Luke may hold the answer to, to those questions. We'd skipped over it when I was doing that survey of Luke, but in chapter 22, starting in verse 24, this is what Luke wrote. It says, Also a dispute arose among them at this meal as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But... You are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. How remarkable it must have been for these disciples just a, a few days later to recall what they were actually arguing about at this meal. Which one of them would be considered the greatest? And this came up because Jesus had alluded to the fact that he was going away, possibly even facing death. And this is, this is what they were thinking about? Which one of them would be greatest? Now, they want to know who will take his place. Who's going to have the title of leader after he's gone? Never mind that Jesus could be talking about dying. Maybe it was a seating arrangement that they had at the table because usually whoever was the guest of honor or hosting the dinner, those people that were in next of importance would sit close to those people. Only two people sat on either side of Jesus. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't James. It wasn't Thomas. It's thought that it was John on the one side, the writer of this gospel, John, and on the other side of Jesus sat Judas. 
And that's taken by the scriptures that are written. There have been other discussions about who is the greatest that Jesus He's had to deal with them over the time of his ministry. It truly looks like they would have figured it out by now. So this is when Jesus actually gives them the imagery. He acts it out. What humbleness means. The greatness that he's teaching about is washing their feet. Maybe it's a picture that they can have in their minds of a rabbi, their teacher, willing to submit to the, the lowest of jobs to serve them. That servant leadership I was talking about earlier. This being greater than someone else, this competition to attain power and wealth and prestige, it's all just a show. It doesn't really mean anything in the end. Our, our culture makes a great deal out of it today, but what truly means something is how our heart is moved toward our neighbor. Whether it's an actual neighbor or not, Jesus is showing them that greatness isn't a title. It's a, an action. It's a, a heart of tenderness, a leader who serves others and cares for them. Each of them will be given a place in God's kingdom, he says, but they need to learn to serve each other and, and those that they will be leading in the future. He's showing them how to do this. So let's go back to chapter 13. John says, He, Jesus, came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you, you have no part with me. And then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. No, pride gets in our way. G Peter was a proud man, you can tell. He didn't want to humili humiliate Jesus by having him wash his feet. Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Not only is Jesus giving them a picture of what it means to be a leader, but there could be some additional symbolism in the mix here, here as well. To enter into the kingdom of God, we, we really should be baptized. Is that an essential to salvation? I don't want to say it is or it isn't. What I'll say is Jesus told his disciples to go and baptize people in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's what I want to see done. To me, it gives a seal of God upon us uh, that when that happens, we've, we've been redeemed. Will everyone be baptized or have the opportunity to, to be baptized after they came, claim Jesus as their Lord and Savior? No. There's things that come up. There's a timing issues that happen. Sometimes it's at the last breath that they give their lives to Jesus. So they may have missed that baptism. And I think God understands that. But if you haven't been baptized, don't wait around. Get it done. Get it done soon. We may think that we are saved, and I believe that we are, but unless Jesus washes us completely, we aren't clean. We get so stubborn. We can be like Peter. We're too proud to be baptized. I remember as an older youth or a young adult, we don't want to subject ourselves to doing something like that in public. I, I used to think that way. Uh, there were certain things I was never going to do, and one of them was come down to the altar and pray because everybody would talk about me and the sins that I'd done, whether they knew what I was praying about or not. could be this, that I need a little help on my test. And the other thing I didn't want to have done is baptism in front of people. But if that's a sense of pride. That the importance of baptism have not been shown to me that. I'm sure they talked about it, but as a teenager, I didn't listen. 
I now know that it's a part of our public admission that we are followers of Jesus, that we have committed ourselves to him. It becomes our witness to Jesus. And if we aren't willing to do that one thing, to humble ourselves in submission to his direction, then, then have we truly given ourselves over to him? If you haven't been baptized, think about Peter and how he was too stubborn. Is that going to be you? Will Jesus say, unless I wash you, you have no part with me? And I'll just leave it there for you to think about. Verse 12. It says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Do you understand what I've done for you, he says. That's a million-dollar question, isn't it? <clears throat> These disciples will need to rely upon each other in the days after his resurrection. They will become the messengers, but they are not the message. They are not to forget that they are serving him. None of them will be what Jesus is and, or what he represents salvation to the world but but they can do a better job at presenting themselves as emissaries of Jesus their message about Jesus will be judged by other people because they'll watch them and how they act and a lot of it will be determined on how they act and whether they will accept that message are they haughty do they talk down to people or belittle them or are they willing to go to where people are who need to hear that message of Jesus and salvation that's been the mark of the Christian. If you were trying to describe a Christian, I mean a true Christian, one of the things that somebody might say is that they're humble. Another might be that, that they do good things for other people. John Wesley and his preachers were known for going where other preachers wouldn't go, to the coal mines, the slums, to, to reach the dregs of the earth in order to tell people about Jesus. For most clergy at the time in England, uh, the goal was to get a city church, but not for the Methodist circuit riders. They would ride all over the country in all types of weather and endure all types of things to bring the gospel to all the people. Throughout history, you'll read of great people who gave themselves to further the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Mother Teresa, she does come to mind. Younger people probably don't remember her. She worked with the poorest of the poor for decades in Calcutta and in India. And when she early on had to come to grips with the poverty and the lack of everything that she had, she had a tough time for a bit. Let me quote what Catherine Spink, who wrote the author, uh, author of the Mother Teresa Complete Authorized Biography, had to say for Mother Teresa when she came to this, Mother Teresa says, Our Lord wants me to be free nun covered with the poverty of the cross. Today I learned a good lesson. The, the poverty of the poor must be so hard for them. Well, while looking for a home, this is early in her ministry, I walked and walked till my arms and legs ached. I thought how much they must ache in body and soul looking for a home, uh, food, and health. And then the comfort of Loreto. This was where she came from, her, her congregation. She would think of the comfort there, and it, would, it came to tempt me, she says. You have only to say the word, and all that will be yours again, the tempter kept saying to her. A free choice, my God, and out of love for you, I desire to remain and do whatever be your holy will in my regard. I did not let a single tear come. I think everybody would agree that was a, 
a remarkable lady that only comes once in maybe every hundred years. Without people like Mother Teresa and others, the gospel probably wouldn't get very far. If all people just wanted the glory when they preach, well, we could all be televangelists, couldn't we? I'm not saying that there aren't some TV preachers who are genuine, have had a calling. But those who want to get donations in order to purchase a bigger jet so they can fly from city to city, that, that comes into question for me. I don't know about you, Nancy, as Ronald Reagan would say, I don't know about you, Nancy, <laughs> but that seems a little bit much. No, followers of Jesus need him as their example of being a servant to all. Have you noticed anything else about Jesus washing the, the disciples' feet? Anything that might make it difficult, maybe? You know, there was one who was going to betray him. And yes, Jesus was washing the feet of Judas. So I've got to wonder, what's, what's John thinking about as he's writing this gospel down? It's in the hours and the days after Jesus has been arrested, and we see them huddled in that room, praying. They all knew it was Judas who had turned on them, turned on Jesus. Maybe they thought that Maybe they thought that Jesus didn't even know that that's what Judas was going to do, but that just couldn't be right. How could he do that? How could he know and still bend down in humility and wash that man's feet? I'm going to leave it there. We'll come back next week. So for now, let's let Daisy and Brandon lead us in our last song. And if you have a prayer request, concern that you want, don't be stubborn. Feel free to come down and I'll pray with you.